first have Matthias Mann, then we'll have Martin Borg Jensen on Zoom, and then uh, we will have Alex. Thank you very much. So, it's a great pleasure for me to introduce the next speaker, who is uh, Professor Matthias Mann from uh, University of Copenhagen. Okay, um, so I start my countdown now. Okay, thank, um, thank you to the organizers for inviting me to give this talk. Um, it's not exactly my field, but um, we are a kind of technology people in the um, proteomic space, and um, we have worked on, on aging, and uh, I believe our technology and work is, um, is relevant to this field. I still see that uh, half of the audience is still talking there and eating, uh, so maybe you could come here. Um, so I'm uh, in two places. So I should first say this disclaimer. So I'm going to mention this company that, that's actually a Danish startup company uh, making some of this single cell work possible. Um, so, uh, but I said also when it comes to that. So my group is in two places, and uh, one is just um, five minutes from here with a bicycle uh, and the same place where Ian Hickson is, basically, so next to the Mass Tower though. Uh, and the other place is a thousand kilometers from here, it's at the Max Planck Institute in uh, Munich, so that's the place where the Oktoberfest is in case you need to place it. Um, and um, so we are working on proteomics, so basically a technology-driven group. And uh, we've worked on that for many years. And why is that interesting? Because we can do the same as gene expression can by transcription, uh, but except we're looking at the proteins, and then uh, the proteins are the actual actors in the cell. So you, you're one step closer to the function, and you can also study many things related to where are the cells and how do they turn over, how do they signal, uh, you know, what are their post-translation modifications, and so on. So we try to, so it's basically, old-fashioned biochemistry on steroids, right, because we're looking at everything all at once. So that's what I want to do, and uh, how we do it is shown here. Uh, we do that by mass spectrometry, so there are also different kinds of proteomics with antibodies or binders, but we do it by mass spectrometry. So uh, we have to do three things. We have to extract the proteins from uh, a source, and that could be even dinosaurs or whatever, or it could be stool, whatever and we extract the proteins from that, and then we digest them to peptides because we can better analyze them in the mass spectrometer. And for a protein, we might get like 30 different peptides. It tells us a bit about um, isoforms as well. And we can, um, so we use two different platforms. One is um, the Bruca platform, and the other one is the Thermo platform. And we now use something called data independent acquisition, which is given a big boost to the reproducibility of the data. Once you have the data, this could be gigabytes, you have to analyze them like other, um, like other omics technologies to, to find correlations, outliers, and, and so on. So our group is working mainly in these three, in these four quadrants here. So we do a bit of, uh, uh, quite a bit of bioinformatics development, and I'll just show you quickly that that's also going in the direction of, um, of deep learning and so on, because that's relevant to this audience. Uh, then hardcore MS technology development, um, uh, post-translation modifications, which are also very important in aging, but I won't have time to talk about it. And then uh, uh, last five, seven years, increasingly we try to go into the clinic. Um, so uh, that's, that's kind of what um, that means for us. So we do mainly plasma or tissue proteomics with mass spectrometry, and that's to phenotype humans and better understand diseases and uh, finding uh, new and better biomarkers. So this could be prognostic, for instance, or diagnostic. Uh, and this is from a review a couple of years ago where we, um, um, in, uh, yeah, it's now five years ago in molecular systems biology, and that's where we described why that had been difficult uh, at that point, and now there's many more um, successes, as I'll show. So we have actually worked uh, over the years in, um, uh, in aging, and this is, uh, just dug this up for this talk from 13 years ago. So this is um, 
I, I thought it was a good paper. It has made absolutely zero impact on the aging field. Uh, and that's mainly also because it was, um, it was um, in a specialized proteomics journal. But um, so we have um, different models of aging. And in the mouse, it's kind of hard for me to tell how old they are. Uh, in C. elegans, it's quite easy to tell. Uh, and um, then we have a human model, and it's also quite easy to tell for us, you know, whether, uh, uh, whether they are old or young. Um, but what we did in that, um, in that paper uh, 13 years ago is that we could measure quite accurately 4,000 pro proteins in either C. elegans um, or in humans. So the C. elegans curve is the blue one, uh, so it shows you quite a spread, uh, you know, because the old C. elegans looks a bit decrepit, and that also goes along with the uh, deregulated proteome. That's why the curve is broad. Uh, but for the mouse, uh, you know, we, we took three brain regions and heart and kidney. We could hardly see any significant changes. So what we took from that is that in the mammalian, like the mouse, um, the mouse keeps um, a functional proteome to old age and not actually that easy to see uh, significant changes, but that was also with the technology from many years ago. So we work a lot on this um, technology, so there's some of my students that uh, work on this uh, mass spec platform, we work together with Bruca, and uh, I don't want to go into the details here, but, uh, but we're using a eye mobility uh, device in front of the mass spectrometer now, um, by the first stage of the mass spectrometer, and then that gives us now um, a huge increase in sensitivity that uh, leads to some of the advances that I'm going to allude to. So, um, uh, so this is the setup at the Max Planck Institute in Munich. So there's uh, quite a number of these mass spectrometers. So they're unfortunately quite expensive. And uh, so we have like, a, it's a bit like a sequencing facility um, in the old days, except we have a lot of mass spectrometers. Uh, so what can you then do? So this is from two years ago. So we took actually uh, um, Kingdom of Life, uh, like we took a hundred different um, um, proteomes uh, across the kings of, of life, and then we we could uh, and with our uh, fancy workflow there, uh, best workflow at the time, and we um, so apart from the genome, so they all had the genome sequence, we now can say what is the expressed proteome quantitatively and we could see some common themes across all forms of lives and also kind of interesting that we, in that one publication we doubled the number of proteins that there was actually experimental evidence uh, for since the beginning of time. And I should also say the two students, they just um, uh, did this as a hobby project. Okay, anyway, so we, uh, as I said already, we, we do a lot of software development, so I just wanted to get this in, that in this field, as in any other field, uh, we believe it's very important to follow open science, and um, particularly as you get fancy with the, uh, uh, with the machine learning, it has to be all open source in our view, uh, and, um, and that's what I try to do, and now there's the tools for that, so it's, um, it's actually um, also the best way to develop software. It's not only the most ethical way, I would say, but, um, or responsible way, but also the best way quality-wise. So we work on a lot of uh, things. We also call them alpha ecosystem. So this is for analyzing the mass spec data um, with deep learning. Um, uh, so that's coming into our field. Um, but you can also do other things with it. And I just wanted to put this in here. So the com our community has uh, found a lot of um, um, a lot of um, post-sensation modifications on proteins, so the function of most of them is uh, completely unknown. Um, and, but with the alpha fold now, what we could do at least is that we, um, um, we can take, so now every protein, uh, just the moment you have the sequence, you can actually get a pretty good model from alpha fold. And then on the other hand, there's um, uh, databases of uh, hundreds of thousands of modifications. Now we can put the two things together so we can place all the modifications in the 3D context as shown here. Uh, and, uh, and then uh, uh, that gives you a lot of times a handle on the function or at least some idea. And we were also happy then there was just recently the one year anniversary of the original tweet about the upper fold and they uh, ha had now um, 
like highlighted eight things that people had done with this, and we were one of them uh, with this paper here that came out in PLOS Biology earlier this year. Uh, and this is uh, alpha pep deep, so we can uh, do deep learning for proteomics and just want to highlight this, so it's, uh, don't pay attention to the details, but um, this is a fast changing field, but this, we just put this on bioarchive, and uh, we have a model shop, so take on point here is that this doesn't need to be complicated, so when you take this, you can predict anything from the peplet from the sequence, mainly for mass spectrometry, but also for other things with just a few lines of code. So that's becoming very democratic, and here's an overview of where we think that's going, not only in our field, but also for biomarker development, which is of interest to some in this crowd. Okay, but now closer to home. Uh, what can we do with proteomics? Uh, we can, of course, that has, been, that has a long and controversial history, just think of Tyrannos. Uh, so we can take a finger prick of blood and then, uh, and then we can see whether that's a good uh, measure of phenotyping the human. And the cool thing about mass spectrometry would be, or proteomics in general, would be uh, one it would be one test for all, right? Like if I could uh, quantify a lot of proteins in the blood very accurately and very specifically, uh, that wouldn't only be a test for liver disease, it could be cognitive decline, it could be aging, it could be anything, right? So that's easy said and very difficult to do. Uh, and, um, but, but we uh, started again with that in like five, seven years ago, and this is kind of the idea that you build up this knowledge base. And again, the advantage of mass spec here is that it's very specific because the data is very digital uh, and it's very quantitative. Um, so this is a workflow we described a number of years ago. So I should say, uh, yes, it has all these advantages. The, the big disadvantage is that we cannot go very deep into the plasma. But we kind of um, hope to go deeper. There's, uh, there's approaches now to do that. Uh, and again, uh, we can make it up with uh, being very quantitative. Uh, so this is uh, now, so now we're focus, uh, uh, focusing on liver disease. And um, um, so what we then get is that um, so we have studied uh, Nuffield and also ALD, uh, uh, and uh, what we get is these uh, volcano plots where we can say something is a uh, new biomarker. We actually did find new biomarkers here, and we get these gigantic correlation maps where we can see you know, what um, ends up together and predict something like, and we find that the proteomics levels are actually a lot of times more informative than the clinical data. Uh, but you can use them all together, and they predict each other. So this is now a, a very recent thing, so that Lily knew did here in my group in Copenhagen, and uh, uh, we're looking at, um, this is an unmet clinical need, uh, you know, when, when fibrosis begins and starts to be irreversible, and um, we have all these plasma samples, we have paired um, uh, biopsies, uh, so we can say where do the biomarkers actually come from, and uh, the heat map shows you also there's some time delay for some of the biomarkers, uh, before they come into the plasma. So, um, and this is also very uh, complex, but uh, what this um, shows is that, um, um, so this is predictive value by um, um, machine learning algorithms, so pre predictive value of uh, the proteomics is in blue, and uh, all the other measures like ultrasound and liver enzymes in the blood, uh, they are the other ones, so we compared against all of them, and now for the first time ever, uh, proteomics came out on top, so we are better at uh, same level or better than uh, the existing uh, methods that are used in the hospital today. So we're quite um, proud of that, and that was in collaboration with a um, group in um, Odense here in Denmark. And of course, the mass spec is on quite a trajectory. So this is this was published in Nature Medicine just uh, a few months ago, and. Uh, made these uh, cartoons, you know, about the liver and what you should do. Um, okay, so that was, yeah, and then there's a lot of, um, there was also alluded to, there's a lot of ethical aspects to this because you may not want to know uh, that you're getting Alzheimer in 14 years, right? So we have to see, do we extract the maximum knowledge or what does the patient actually want to, to know and what does the physician need to know? So we also have some publications about that if you're interested. Uh, and this doesn't only work on plasma, but it works on, um, on CSF as well. It actually works better on CSF and urine because there we can go quite deep. And we have already uh, had an um, Alzheimer's study 
um, and, um, and we're now measuring through um, another CSF study that's 6,000 patients. So there we can just few microliters and we can quantify very well 1,200 proteins and we got in that case the 40 protein signature of a, a D across three different cohorts and what's gratifying to me then you know without putting anything in uh, tau in the CSF came out on top and that's a good positive control and um, yeah so I have to rush through this um, so now um, rest of the talk will be single cell proteomics and specifically how we can look in um, tissue so we have focused on um, cancer of course but uh, but you can just substitute senescent cells in your head for that um, so and the omics community is generally going into the tissue direction uh, and uh, uh, as opposed to just um, um, uh, just um, cell culture and these are some different ways how you can get single cells and usually they disaggregate which is actually very harsh uh, and then you need to um, sort of um, not lose the single cell and that applies to transcriptomics as well as to proteomics so there's some different ways how you can uh, not lose the single cell and then you need to measure it by proteomics in a certain way so we worked with the mass spectrometer vendor to make the instrument more sensitive and that's this company I mentioned initially so we got a factor of 10 by slowing down the flow rate uh, and we have to have a very small reaction volume to do this so then we do all this and we can only measure 40 single cells per day um, but, um, but this can be done now and we can actually do so this is a proof of principle came out earlier this year we can find proteins that are involved in the cell cycle and it's very quantitative so it's actually much more quantitative than transcriptomics that's because uh, every single cell has a complete proteome but it has very few uh, transcripts per um, uh, for, for all the genes, especially in post mitotic tissues, because the cell just doesn't need this transcript for anything. So that's the leg up. So, and then last, in closing, uh, last story, um, that's where we put most of our energy, and this also happens to be the cover uh, of Nature Biotechnology this month, and that's single uh, cell type tissue proteomics. So, what is that? So, previously in the cancer context, we looked in uh, like this is ovarian cancer and we looked at the cells versus the stroma we found some biomarkers that could be drugged um, so that was good but there was still 5,000 cells and of course we want to resolve this tissue heterogeneity like this uh, and um, and then this is the team here uh, in uh, Copenhagen and working with Peter Horworth uh, um, AI in Hungary so ideas you use like digital pathology, so you do high content imaging of your tissue, uh, and then uh, we use the AI to define the cells and cell types, and now we cut it out, um, and, um, and then we use the ultra-sensitive proteomics uh, to actually see what is the proteome, and uh, that is a proxy for the function of these cells. So, um, uh, so this is an example, so this is melanoma, so we have all these different regions uh, and we can actually in the different regions follow the melanocytes um, uh, uh, all the way to the uh, melanoma cells. So um, this is actually then a big deal so you can do, get a lot of data out of a single uh, slide. So this is the same slide after the AI and staining for some proliferation markers. Uh, and then we can get cell uh, type specific proteomes uh, and then we can do gene set en enrichment, map that back on, on the picture, and we know what all these cells are doing. So, for instance, when the melanoma is uh, very superficial, it's um, good, uh, and if it's, uh, if it's gone deep into your skin, it's very bad news. And, but we can also say what do the melanoma cells do at the surface and what do they do uh, further down. So, um, for instance, they, further down, they break down the extracellular matrix, as an example. So, and now we are getting towards also single cells in the tissue, and this is just showing, uh, showing you cutting out just a few cells and analyzing, in this case, in liver with fibrosis. Okay, that, um, yeah, and if you wanted, to, so we also just recently wrote a review in for the 25th anniversary of molecular cell, um, so if you want to know how we think this fits into the omics, uh, spatial omics. 
So with that, I'd like to thank our collaborators and I'd like to thank you for uh, listening to my very rushed talk. Thank you very much, Matthias. So uh, a question, yeah. This is really wonderful. Uh, have you taken any of the proteomic analysis of your diseases and then applied your alpha fold and PTM analysis just to see if there are any PTMs that would be enriched or the pathways in those top hits that you find in the diseases? Uh, yeah, that's exactly what we do. So we, uh, like whenever we have a PTM now, and doesn't, it's not only PTMs, but also we've differentially regulated isoforms, right? So you can immediately put them on the suggested um, structure and um, there's some really cool things. So for instance, you have regulated phosphorylation site, or uh, it's known for kinases, but also for instance solid carriers. It can be in a hinge region between two um, between two domains, right? And then that's what's very likely is that you put the phosphorylation in the hinge region, and you have a rearrangement. And now it gets active, right? So it can really lead you in some cases to a function of the protein. I was thinking. I was thinking if, if there were if there are some metabolites that would be enriched in regulation of those disease-related. Uh, the metabolites? Proteins. Yes, like that are used for the, for uh, the post-mitotic uh, uh, modification. Yeah, so that's a good point. So we haven't done that yet, but there are mass spec techniques for uh, these metabolites where they sit on the protein. Yeah, we'll have the last question. So I wonder um, what, what your thoughts are on um, using proteomics as a standard uh, clinical diagnostic tool. So will it remain a, a, a discovery tool, or do you think there could be really a, a routine use in medical diagnostics? Um, yeah, we actually think it can be a routine, so it's, it, it is actually a routine for small molecules like cyclosporin, vitamin D is always mass spectrometry, and we think this can be the case for plasma proteomics as well, so we want to bring the cost down and make it much more robust, and there's no reason it has to be expensive then. Uh, and, uh, yeah, we have actually a mass spectrometer in the Ries Hospital here, the biggest hospital, as well as similar in, in Munich. Uh, so that's what we're going to do, but it's a lot of hard work still. Thank you very much, Matthias. So...